that was quite an introduction. I found myself thinking, man, I want to listen to this guy. <laughs> it's enough to make a brown man blush. There are a lot of people around the world, over six billion people in the world, many of whom are Muslim, and I'm hoping many of whom are watching this tonight. We gotta keep in mind that what we're discussing tonight is not just an abstract set of ideas, but real people and real lives, every single one of which has been created by God. And so we need to remember that. We need to remember why we're here, for what purpose we're here, and we'll discuss this a little bit more at the end. But I am going to initiate this in prayer, and I hope that you will join me, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Muslim here tonight, whoever you are, please join me in prayer, and let's ask our Creator God to open up our hearts to His truth so that we may know Him more and introduce people to Him because He is the source of life. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for creating us. You didn't have to do that. You had no moral obligation to create us. Nothing except your love can explain why you created us. And God, we pray that we would glorify you with everything that we are. When as a child I used to pray, subhanallah, all glory be to God. Alhamdulillah, all praise be to God. And now God, even more I ask you, use this time to honor yourself through our minds and through our hearts. Draw us closer to you in knowledge and in truth. And be here with us because you've told us when we gather in your name, there shall you also be. Lord, lead us to the truth. We pray this in your name. Amen. Now, when I was born, I was born here in the United States, which hopefully you can tell by my accent, not all Muslims come from overseas. Um, otherwise, I would sound like this and maybe it would be a bit different for you. But no, I sound like this. I'm American. Um, a lot of Muslims are born and raised in the United States. So there's Muslims of various kinds. You have Muslims who are immigrants. You have Muslims who are born here. You have Muslims who are devout. You have Muslims who are nominal. Muslims of all different kinds. Now my family is a very, very devout family. My mother was the daughter of a Muslim missionary. So they used to call them da'is. They still do. And a da'i is someone who spends his life inviting people to Islam. My grandfather spent his life in Indonesia preaching Islam in the jungles and inviting people to accept Muhammad and the Quran and Allah as their God. And so my mother then, being the daughter of a devout Muslim missionary, when she came to the United States, was ready to raise a family that was also very devout. By the way, my grandmother, also a Muslim missionary's uh, daughter as well, she was born in Uganda, where her father was a physician and a Muslim preacher. So we have Muslims who are spending their lives preaching Islam, and that's kind of the heritage I come from on my mother's side. Very, very devout. My father, he came from Pakistan in the 70s. He actually came the day that Elvis died. So just so you know how much about uh, America he knew, when he lands, he looks at a newspaper. The newspaper says, the king is dead. He says, I could have sworn they had a democracy. I got to learn this one all over again. <laughs> That's how my parents came to this country. They came very, very innocent. They came very, very much in love with their culture, in love with their family. And so when I was born, my mom taught me how to live a devout Muslim life. It was an integral part of who we were. So what does that look like? At a very young age, I was taught many sections of the Quran. The last seven chapters of the Quran, I had memorized in Arabic by the age of five. Now you have to do that. That's not something that's abnormal. If you're going to read the daily prayers, which Muslims do, devout Muslims do anyway, then you have to memorize portions of the Quran. And every single day I used to hear my father recite the Quran as he led us in prayer. So you're going to memorize it. If you hear the scripture every day, you will memorize it. And that's how we learned it as Muslims. Praying five times a day. I read the entire Quran in Arabic by the age of five. So that's what it's like to be a devout Muslim. You memorize your scripture, you remember God in everything you do. To give you an idea of what it was like as a child, in, in the United States now, my mom had taught me, Nabil, you have to follow the traditions of Muhammad. So what did that look like? First thing in the morning, when I would wake up, before I even left the bed, I would recite a prayer. Alhamdulillah, hilladhi ahyana ba'da ma'amatana wa alayhi noshur. Anyone speak in tongues? No? 
I didn't know what it meant, by the way. No one had taught me the translation of that. Just reciting these prayers in Arabic invoked blessings upon us in our home. But what the prayer means is all praise belongs to the one who gave me life, causes me to die, and will raise me up again. So this is a prayer thanking God for giving us life and foreshadowing the resurrection. But it's also a prayer that we pray daily saying, God, thank you for giving me sleep and waking me up from sleep. I had no idea how to wake myself up. All praise belongs to the one who gives me life again, wakes me up every single morning. And that is the kind of mindset a devout Muslim has, remembering Allah in the morning even before leaving the bed. And then when I got off the bed, I'd walk towards the bathroom, and already I'm thinking in terms of Muslim rituals. Because when I get to the bathroom, I have to walk in, I have to cross the threshold with my left foot first. Can't do it with my right foot. And the reason why is because Muhammad taught that if you walk into a washroom, you do so with your left foot first. And then as I approach the the, the sink, I'm reciting prayers, and I'm about to do the ceremonial washing in order to prepare myself for the first of the five daily prayers. And in the middle of doing all that, I'm reciting things in Arabic. Now, my family doesn't speak Arabic at home, by the way. We speak Urdu, which is the language of Pakistan. But Muhammad spoke in Arabic, and so we learn all these prayers in Arabic every step of the way, trying to emulate Muhammad and to honor God through that. So after reciting these prayers, I'd walk down to the prayer rug, which was uh, right by our kitchen, and I'd recite the first of my five daily prayers, the Fajr prayer. But before reciting that prayer, I had a prayer to recite, and then after the prayer, I had a post-prayer prayer. (laughs) So all kinds of prayers constantly throughout the day. Before I've even left the home, all I've been really doing is reciting prayers. And once I got to school, Then my mom had taught me something else about my identity. So one half of my identity was to live a devout Muslim life, but my mom, who came from Pakistan, she understood the West to be a a Christian nation. Most people who are immigrants to the West, they see America, they think this is a Christian nation. And so what they see on TV, what they see in the public, what they see everybody doing, they impute all of that to Christianity. So all the immorality you see in movies, all the immorality you see on the streets and and the way people are clad on the beaches, the average Muslim immigrant will impute all of that to Christianity. And so what are they going to say then? My mother had taught me, Nabil, you need to be prepared against Christianity. You need to know why Islam is true and if anyone ever asks you why Islam is true, you need to be able to give them reasons to defend your Islamic faith but you also need to be able to challenge people and show them why Christianity is false. So at a young age, I'm reading books that are teaching me things about Christianity, giving me Bible verses to quote to explain to people why the gospel is false. And so when I'd get to school, I'd have conversations with friends. I remember a very specific one from 11th grade. Uh, It was in my Latin class, and there was a girl in front of me who I thought was a bit crazy. Um, she had this kind of look on her face like she was at total peace all the time and you just kind of wanted to smack her. You're like, wake up. (laughs) And when she talked to you, she talked with this kind of passion and conviction. Uh, We thought she was crazy. Turned out she was on fire for the Lord, but it looks the same if you don't know what that is. (laughs) And so she turns around one day and she says to me, Nabil, can I ask you a question? I said, go ahead. She says, do you know Jesus? Now, I had been prepared. I had been scripted with the response to this question. So I said to her, in fact, Betsy, I do know Jesus. And she looks at me. I say, the Quran teaches me that Jesus is virgin born. The Quran teaches me that Jesus is the most miraculous man who ever lived. The Quran says that Jesus was able to heal the blind, cleanse the leper, even raise the dead. The Quran says that Jesus is the Messiah, and I know as a Muslim he's gonna come back at the end of time and initiate the latter days. And she's looking at me wide-eyed because I must have gone off script. (laughs) So I went ahead and continued for her. I said, but Betsy, I also know that Jesus is not God. And she says, no, Nabil, that's the most important part. Jesus is God. I said, really? Do you believe that? And she says, yes. And I said, is that important for your faith that Jesus is God? And she says, yes. I said, okay, fine. For the moment, I'm gonna grant the four gospels. Now, I believe that the gospels have been corrupted. I think that they can't be trusted, but for the moment, Betsy, let's say that the gospels are reliable, that they still say what they always said. Where does Jesus claim to be God in the gospels? She thought for a moment, and she said, well, how about when Jesus says, the Father and I are one? 
I said, that's not him claiming to be God. He says very explicitly what he's actually claiming there. He says, I pray for the disciples to be one just as I am one with the Father. So he's not claiming to be one being with the Father. He's not claiming to be God. He's claiming to be unified in the Spirit. So his disciples, he's praying for them to be one, unified in the Spirit, just as he is unified with the Father. I said, Betsy, if you want to see what Jesus actually says about himself, why not go to the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus is walking through a crowd and someone touches him and he says, who touched me? Are you telling me God doesn't know who touches him? Or how about when he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. How could he be God if he's asking that question? Or how about in Mark chapter 13, when he says, no one knows when the end of times is, neither the angels nor the son, but only the father. I'm, Betsy, it's pretty clear. He says he doesn't know when the end of times is, only God knows when the end of times is. How could he possibly be God if he says he doesn't know when the end of times is, only God knows? I said, but you quoted the book of John. If you wanna quote the Gospel of John, how about you quote that verse where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. As I'm looking at her with each Bible verse I'm quoting, I've realized she hasn't looked at any of this before. And so I said, Betsy, if you want to know who Jesus is, ask me about Islam and I'll share the real Jesus with you. And so in this moment of someone, the only person, by the way, who ever shared the gospel with me in high school, I took around her attempt to share the gospel and made it into my own dawah. I invited her to Islam through her attempt to share the gospel with me because she hadn't been prepared for the reason for her belief. Now, by the way, I want to clarify something, though. The moment she asked me if I believed in Jesus, my respect for her went up. Because I took a look at all the people in my class who called themselves Christian, and I knew that they believed in order for me to go to heaven, I had to believe in Jesus. But none of them have ever asked me that. So I thought one of two things must be true. Either they don't really believe their faith, or they don't care if I go to hell. If you as a Christian did not ask me if I believed in Jesus, then I believed either you didn't really believe your faith, or you didn't care if I went to hell. So my respect for her went through the roof. And by the way, it was really easy to mess with Christians on stuff because a lot of people hadn't thought about things. If I I just wanted to have a blast, I'd just say the word Trinity, explain. Most people hadn't thought of it. Say, do you believe in the Trinity? Yes, I do. Well, what is it? God is three in one. Well, he's not a shampoo bottle. What does it mean for God to be three in one? Can you explain that to me? Well, and, and then I'd get kinds of like illustrations. God is like ice and water and vapor. I'm like, no, he's not. God is not like ice and water and vapor. And I said, no, well, he's like an egg. I'm like, this is getting worse. <laughs> what does it mean for God to be three in one? And usually what people would end up with is, well, it's a divine mystery and you have to believe it by faith. And I would say, look, it sounds to me that you're using the word faith as a substitute for ignorance and I want no part of that faith. That's how I saw Christianity. And each time I had a conversation with Christians, it bolstered my faith as a Muslim, and it made me want to share Islam with people, because I saw the Trinity as polytheism, and polytheism is one of the worst kinds of sins. Now all this would have changed if I had simply encountered someone who had a reason for the hope that lies within them, which, by the way, is a biblical command from 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to share a reason for the hope that lies within you. And the first time I met a Christian who was ready with that was in college. So I've already decimated the faith of a lot of people going up to college. (laughs) And then I get to college very confident in myself. And I meet a friend. Now this friend and I were out on a public speaking and uh, debate tournament. And uh, we were sharing a room together. And I saw him one night reading the Bible. And I thought, okay, this will be fun. Let's take down another Christian. It'll be amusing. And so I look at my friend, his name was David. I said, David, do you realize that book you're reading is not trustworthy? It's been corrupted over time. And he's reading his Bible and he closes it and he says, go on. Which should have been a sign for me that this wasn't gonna go my way, but I just (laughs) kept going. And I said, David, Jesus spoke Aramaic, did he not? And then the earliest church was in Palestine, it was in Jerusalem, it was, it was in Israel, so they must have spoken Hebrew, but by the time the New Testament's written, it's written in Greek. 
So you have a translation of a translation of Jesus' words before it's ever written down. And then the New Testament that lasted the longest period of time in the church was not actually in Greek, it was in Latin. So you have another translation, then it's in Latin for a thousand years before it comes into German, and from German it goes into English, and that's where we get the KJV. It's a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation, which is why you have the KJV, the NIV, the ESV, the NASV, the who knows what V. You got so many versions of the Bible, how can I know which one's actually the word of God? Now that had worked on many Christians, and I was ready for him to crumple under the weight of my argumentation. But David looked at me and he said, Nabil, let me ask you a question. Just a few minutes ago, I heard you speaking to your mom on the phone. Was that in English? I said, no. And he said, but when you told me what she said, you told me in English. Was that a corrupted translation? No. He said, Nabil, when you are multilingual, you can take a message that's given in one language and accurately translate that message into another language, and you've preserved the message. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They're able to listen to Jesus, whatever language Jesus spoke, and write it in Greek. And of that Greek New Testament manuscript, we have in our possession over 6,000 copies today. And he said, Nabil, if we didn't have any one of those copies, we have in our possession over 10,000 Latin, Coptic, and Syriac translations of the early Greek New Testament manuscripts. And he said, if we didn't have any of those translations, we have over 30,000 quotations of the New Testament from the early church fathers with which we can reconstruct virtually the entire New Testament many times over again. Nabil, we know with certainty the message of the original New Testament. And I looked at him and I said, David, You're making this up. (laughs) I said, I've talked to dozens of Christians. No one have told me this before. He said, you think I'm making this up? I said, yeah, I think you're making this up. He said, well, then you better bring it. I'm like, it's been brought. Let's go. (laughs) And so from that point on, David and I start arguing about these things, but we do it in a pursuit of truth. In fact, we start arguing so much that we decide to start signing up for classes together so we can sit in the back and argue with each other the whole time. We go to each other's houses and study and just argue some more. And over the course of time, because we spent so much time together in pursuit of truth, we became best friends. I ended up being one of the groomsmen at his wedding. I was there when his first child was born. All of this time I spent with him becoming closer to him, and in that, I knew that David would take a bullet for me. And when you can trust someone and they share the gospel with you, it makes a huge impact. If you don't know you can trust someone and they tell you to lay down your life and pick up the cross, why would you listen to them? But if you have someone who's trying to tear down your worldview and you know that they love you, then you will engage with them and you will listen to them. So that friendship was absolutely critical in order for me to begin to hear the gospel. And it took a long time. This wasn't an overnight event. But after about a year, I came to the conclusion, all right, the New Testament manuscripts are reliable. I didn't believe in the gospel or anything like that. It was just the New Testament manuscripts. It took me a year. But I realized the way that the New Testament manuscripts proliferated, the way they were written down and sent throughout the early church, there was no one who's able to control these manuscripts and edit them in such a way that a change would not be detected. Simply no way to do that. So after about a year, I came to the conclusion that there is no way for the New Testament to have been uniformly and undetectably altered. Not possible. And so I went back to David and I said, all right, David, I see that the New Testament is reliable, but I don't see Jesus claiming to be God anywhere in the New Testament. Now keep in mind, this is the biggest sticking point for Muslims. Because like I said earlier, Muslims believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Muslims believe that Jesus was the most miraculous man who ever lived. Some Muslims believe he's the only sinless prophet, truly sinless prophet who ever walked this earth. But the moment you say Jesus is God, in a Muslim's eyes, you are committing the worst blasphemy you could ever possibly commit. The Quran says very clearly, chapter four, verse 171, as well as chapter five, verse 72, that if you believe Jesus is God, you will go to hell. There's no arguing with that in the Muslim worldview. Chapter five, verse 116 shows Jesus having a conversation with Allah, and Allah asked Jesus, did you ever tell people to worship you? And he said, by no means do I have the right to tell them to do something like that. 
And so the idea that Jesus is God is blasphemy in Islam and they're trying to defend God when they say there's no way Jesus is God. So the question for me, now that I came to the point of realization that the New Testament was reliable, I said okay, fine, but Jesus never claims to be God in that. And now I began to study with a little bit more depth. I began to try to look at things. My friend David first handed me the Gospel of John. He said, here, read this. And as I read the Gospel of John, John chapter one, verse one says that Jesus is God. (laughs) Don't have to go too far. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, what is the Word? You go down to verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. I'm looking at these sets of verses, and I'm trying to find a way around this, because again, from childhood, I've been told Jesus couldn't be God, and now that I believe the New Testament's reliable, how could it possibly say this? So the way I defended that was by saying, well, Jesus isn't saying he's God here. This is John, the author. I want to see Jesus say he's God. Then as you go through the Gospel of John, you see things that Jesus says, like in John chapter 8, verse 58. Some Jews ask him, they say, you're not even 50 years old, yet you claim to have seen Abraham. And Jesus' response is, amen, amen. Before Abraham was born, I am. Now, you know, when you're Muslim, you haven't heard the term I am before. You don't know what that means. But when someone points you to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where God tells Moses that his name is Anahu, I am, that now it begins to make sense what Jesus is saying. Someone asks him, you're not even 50 years old. Jesus' response is, I am? I eternally exist even before Abraham was born? Yes, because he's taking the name of the God of Moses. It's pretty clear. By the way, if there are any Muslims listening and thinking that's not convincing enough, go to John 20, 28, where someone calls Jesus God, and Jesus' response is basically, finally, (laughs) took you long enough. So then my response to that was, well, forget the Gospel of John. It was written too late. That's not reliable. I want to go to the first Gospel. I want to see where it was written early on. Did Jesus claim to be God? Fortunately, I don't have all the time to go into the details here, but I will tell you this. The culmination of Mark's gospel, the very first gospel ever written, is Mark 14, 62. And in this one verse, Jesus makes two, if not three, references to the Old Testament, saying, I am the God of Moses, I am the God of Daniel, I am the God of David. And he does it so clearly that the high priests immediately tear their robes and say, you have heard the blasphemy, what shall we do? And that's the reason why they decided to crucify him. And they would have been right to crucify him if he weren't God. So Jesus claims to be God. Now imagine what this is doing to my mind because I as a Muslim have now come to the conclusion that the New Testament is reliable and in that New Testament I'm seeing Jesus claim to be God. This makes everything I've ever been taught about Islam false because we're supposed to revere Jesus. But here's evidence he claimed to be God. How can I do that? And this cognitive dissonance began to drive me nuts. Up until this point, I was just arguing with my friend David. But now I come to the realization that this investigation may very well determine the course of my life. And so I start praying fervently. And in the middle of these prayers, I go back to my friend David and I say, well, I need to have a case. I need to have good, solid reasoning for what would make Christianity true. Because Christians believe all kinds of things. There's different denominations. Some Christians believe this. Some Christians believe that. What is the thing that would make the core of Christianity true? And I found it in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You didn't know there was going to be a pop quiz involved. (laughs) Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus has to be God, he has to die on the cross and then rise from the dead for Christianity to be true. Now this is actually a very interesting case. By the time I was uh, wrestling with some of these things, I was in medical school. As a fourth year medical student, I spent a lot of time in the psychiatry ward. (laughs) Spent a lot of time working in the psychiatry ward. And while I was there, I used to see people come up and say to me in delusions of grandeur, Nabil, I am God. And my response to them would be, well, we have a room for you. (laughs) Come on in. To claim to be God is pathological. And in the first century, if someone claims to be God, it's the same response. You are crazy. But if that man then says, no, wait, watch, I will be killed, and on the third day, 
I will rise from the dead, and that's my proof for you that I am God. Now we have something to watch. Now we have something to see. The resurrection is the vindication of Jesus' claim to be God. Anybody can claim to be God, but if someone claims to be God and then proves it by rising from the dead, then there's someone to believe. So the question is, is there evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? Again, if some people wanna ask questions about this or if it wants to come up in the Q&A, then we can discuss it a little bit more. But as I investigated the evidence surrounding Jesus' death, I came to the conclusion that the evidence pointed uniformly to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Now there's something very profound in that because as a Muslim, the Quran doesn't even let you believe that Jesus died on the cross. The Quran says in Surah An-Nisa, which is chapter four, verse 157, wa ma wa He was not killed, nor was he crucified, but so it appeared to them. So the Quran denies that Jesus was killed by crucifixion. But if you study the history of Jesus' life, I'm not talking about Christians studying the history of Jesus' life, I'm talking about atheist, skeptical, agnostic scholars like Paula Fredrickson, like Marcus Borg, like Bart Ehrman, none of whom are Christians, all of them say, if we can know anything about Jesus' life, it's that he died by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. The death of Jesus is the most solid fact regarding his life, historically speaking, and that alone challenges the truth of the Quran. And as a Muslim, I had to really wrestle with that. And then I have all this evidence that he actually rose from the dead. If you want some of that evidence, I would suggest you read a book called The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus by Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona. So I'm seeing this evidence, and I'm seeing a case for Jesus' deity and for Christianity being built up. So... By the way, this has taken three years of friendship with David to get to this point. Not an overnight quest. So David and I are going home from a very manly place. We were at a smoothie bar. (laughs) On the way back, David asks me, he says, Nabil, we've been looking into this for quite a while. Where do you think the case for Christianity falls? From zero to 100, if zero was absolutely not true and 100 was absolutely true, where do you think the case for Christianity stands? I I just thought about each criterion there. Well, it's 99% sure Jesus died on the cross, about 90% sure he claimed to be God, 90% sure he rose from the dead. I'm putting it at 80 to 85%, David. And he about spits out the smoothie, which is not cool because it was my car. And he looks at me and he says, Nabil, well, why don't you accept the gospel then? And I said, David, it's because I'm 100% sure in Islam. Even if I'm 80 to 85% believing in the case of Christianity, the case for Islam is stronger. And he looked at me and he said, Nabil, you haven't even looked critically at the case for Islam. And I said, I know. But I'm just that certain. I've heard evidences of the Quran from childhood. I've heard evidences of Muhammad from childhood. I am certain that Islam is true. And he says, well, put it to the test. And here's the critical thing. He says, test it to the same degree you tested Christianity. The same level of skepticism, apply the same historical criteria, and then tell me what you end up with. And I was very confident. I said, sure, no problem. And so I applied the same level of skepticism, historically speaking. I'm going to have to be brief, but here's what I found. When it came to Jesus, I was extremely skeptical of the Gospel of John, for example, because John's Gospel, according to critical scholars now, not according to Christians, but according to critical scholars, John's Gospel is written between 60 and maybe at the latest 70 years after Jesus' death. And so I was critical of John's Gospel. The first time anyone wrote anything about Muhammad's life was 150 years after his death. And then the person who wrote it, actually that book was lost. And what we have is somebody else who saved portions of that book and said, I only saved a portion of this book because the rest of it, I felt, was just unbelievable. So the first piece of evidence we have on Muhammad's life comes much, much later than the first evidence we have on Jesus' life. And it was claimed by the person who saved it to have been unreliable. And I began doing the side-by-side comparison. Okay, what's the history of the Quran compared to the Bible? Okay, what's Muhammad's life look like? Now, I had been taught from childhood that Muhammad was the most amazing man who ever existed. I had been taught that Muhammad was a great statesman, a great diplomat, a great general, a great leader. I had been taught that he was a great husband and a defender of women's rights. 
and a defender of the downtrodden. That's how Muslims see Muhammad. And so when you see Muslims revering Muhammad, that's the man they're revering, this legendary great man. But when I studied the historical evidence, not only was it late and not really reliable, but when I actually looked at what it said, that Muhammad in the pages of history was very different from the Muhammad in the hearts of Muslims. And I realized I had to pick one or the other. And if I was gonna be honest, and I was gonna follow David's challenge and apply critical historical criteria, this was the Muhammad I'd have to believe existed, a violent one. And so I said, okay, I can't rely on Muhammad then, maybe I have to rely on the inspiration of the Quran. Because Muslims believe in the Shahada. In order to become Muslim, you have to believe in the Shahada, which is La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. So, there's no God but Allah, and I tried to defend that through the Quran, and Muhammad is his messenger. I tried to defend that by investigating his life. This part didn't work, so I then turned to the Quran, and I started saying, well, the Quran must be the word of God. And I went to all the apologetic reasons that I'd been given from childhood as to why the Quran is the word of God. I'd been told the Quran had never changed. I'd been told that the Quran had miracles inside it, miraculous scientific knowledge. I'd been told that the Quran had uh, prophecies of the future. And as I began to investigate each and every single one of these claims, again, with the same critical eye that I used on Christianity, it began to crumble. And when you apply, and I will say this now after having looked at many different worldviews, when you apply the same level of skepticism to Christianity, to any other worldview, Christianity comes out on top. Every single time. And I'm talking way on top. I had a conversation just the other day with some friends at Oxford who were atheists. And they were telling me, Nabil, I have issues with Christianity here, 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 and here. And I said, I see that but apply those same skeptical criticisms to atheism. And all of a sudden, a look of realization dawned upon them because they were beginning to compare. And as Oz Guinness says, someone who works with Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, he says, comparison, contrast, is the mother of clarity. And when I compared Islam to Christianity, I realized Christianity came way on top. Now, this is when my world fell into crisis. Because I couldn't just all of a sudden accept the gospel. If I were to do that, then I would be bringing tremendous shame upon my family. And Muslim families often come from honor-shame backgrounds. So to give you an idea, everything my grandfather did, everything my great-grandfather did in preaching Islam was to build honor and, and, and pride in the community. And if their grandson, if their great-grandson became Christian, then it's as if I leveled all the honor they ever gained in their entire lives. And it's not just me who's gonna be looked at with shame from my family. My family, my mother and father who spent their whole lives pouring into me, if I become a Christian, I'm bringing shame to them and I drag their reputation through the mud and now their lives are destroyed because of my decision. And so these kinds of considerations make it extremely difficult for a Muslim to consider becoming a Christian. On top of that, there is something called the law of apostasy in Islam. Traditionally speaking, and to, to be a little bit more specific, all four schools of traditional Sunni Islam and all three major schools of traditional Shia Islam teach that if you leave Islam, you can be killed in various circumstances. They disagree on the circumstances, but they all agree that it can happen. And so a Muslim has to think about maybe giving up his social life for sure, and maybe even destroying his family's social life, and then maybe even giving up your life itself because of the law of apostasy. And then if you're wrong about all this, the Quran says you're going to hell. Everything literally is balanced. And it makes it extremely difficult for someone to leave Islam. So at this point, I fell to my knees and started asking God in the daily prayers, outside of the daily prayers, I'm asking God, God, I need you to reveal yourself to me. I, I have looked and it looks like Islam is not true, please forgive me for saying that, and it looks like Christianity might be true, please forgive me for saying that, can you tell me who you are? Now, to give you a little bit of understanding and insight into Islamic culture, the veil is not torn down the way Christians believe. According to Islam, the veil is still up 
Muslims don't commune with God. Even the prophets didn't commune with God. The prophets spoke to angels who spoke to God. So Muslims aren't ready to just receive information from God. They're not of that kind of status. They don't think so anyway. But there's one way that Muslims expect to hear directly from God. Anyone know? Dreams. Muslims believe that they can receive dreams from God for guidance. And so they ask God for dreams for guidance. There's a special type of prayer called Salat Istikhara where Muslims specifically get on their knees and say, God, guide me through dreams. My dad chose his jobs based on those. My sister chose her husband based on dreams. Uh, we, we decided when to move based on dreams. And by the way, some of these dreams became prophetically true. For example, my mother, uh, when she got married to my father, she had a dream that she was planting four seeds in the ground. And two of those seeds grew up into trees and two did not. She goes to my aunt and she says, I just had this dream. And my aunt says to her, blessed are you, for God has already told you that you will be pregnant four times and you'll have two children and two miscarriages. Fast forward 17 years, that's exactly what happened. I've got some creepy stories I could share with you, but we don't have enough time. This happens very regularly. Now, why does it happen? It could be a variety of reasons. Is it God giving the dreams? Is it something else giving the dreams? It could be a variety of things. That's not my point. My point is that Muslims expect to hear from God based on dreams, and on the face of it, they have good reason to believe that. And so I asked God for dreams and visions, and I ultimately received one vision and three dreams. I'll give you the second dream because that was the one that was most powerful for me. I wanted something very clear and God gave me a very clear dream. By the way, at this point, it's been about four years since David and I started discussing Christianity and Islam. In this dream, I'm standing at the threshold of a narrow door. This door is just wide enough to fit me, just tall enough to fit me. And there's some depth to it, maybe five or seven feet. It's made of brick, an archway kind of. As I look into that doorway, there's a room set with a feast. Round tables, people sitting at this feast. The food is, has been put out, and people are in fine clothes. It's like a wedding feast, and they're about to start eating, but they haven't started yet. They're all looking that direction. They're waiting for the owner or the speaker or whoever to come and start this feast. And I want to get into that room because I know that that room is heaven, but I can't because at the other end of the doorway is my friend David. David. He's also sitting and waiting, he's not looking at me, but he's kind of blocking the way, I can't get past him. And so I say to him in the dream, I thought we were going to eat together. And he says, you haven't responded. And in the dream, I knew that I had to respond to David's invitation in order to get into heaven. But here's where it gets crazy. When I woke up, I called David, and I asked him, what do you think this dream means? And it was the first time I heard someone's eyes roll over the phone. <laughs> and he says, Nabil, this dream is so clear, I don't need to interpret it for you. Just go to the Bible. And I said, what do you mean? He says, go to Luke chapter 13. Now, David knew his scriptures, by the way, and he had given me a Bible, a study Bible. And when I turned to Luke chapter 13, it said in big, bold letters, the narrow door. Now, the moment I saw that, my heart skipped a beat because that was the most powerful symbol in my dream. And I started reading, I'm gonna paraphrase it for you, and basically here's what it says. Jesus was going through the towns and villages preaching the good news, and the disciples asked him, Lord, are many going to be saved? And he said, make every effort to enter through that narrow door, for many, I tell you, will try, and few will be able. And you will see people sitting inside at the wedding feast of heaven. Make every effort to enter before the owner comes and closes that door. I had never read this section of the Bible before, and I knew God had given me a dream where he placed me right into the middle of this parable, and he told me where I stood. So I looked up at God, and I said, God, I need another dream. <laughs> <laughs> Don't judge me, Christians. <laughs> so I asked for another dream. God gave me another dream, 
And then at the end of that summer, I remember driving to school. By this point, I'm in my, starting my second year of medical school. The first conversation I had with David was my freshman year of college. And so I'm starting my second year of med school, but at this point, I've had three dreams. I have all this evidence. I have guidance from God, yet I haven't converted. And this is the reason why. As I'm driving to school, I say to God, God, I know what I need to do, but I need time to mourn. I need time to mourn. By the way, I'm just crying. I'm just losing it in the car. Not a good state to go to school in. So I go back to my apartment, and I don't know what I'm doing. So I pull out the Quran and the Bible, and I say, God, just give me comfort. And I open up the Quran, and I start reading it. For the first time in my life, I start reading the Quran, not for liturgical reasons, but for personal guidance. And as I'm looking for comfort, I realized There is not a single verse in the Quran designed to to comfort a hurting man. Not one. And so I realized this book didn't even apply to my life, and I put it away. And I turned to the Bible. I said, I don't even know where to start in the Bible. I'd never gone to it for personal guidance either. I'd just gone to it to try to tear it down. And so I say, fine, I'll just start with the New Testament. Opened it to Matthew chapter 1. Saw a bunch of genealogies, so I skipped them. I had an excuse, I was a Muslim, I don't know what your excuse is. <laughs> I skipped him. It didn't take me long to get to Matthew chapter five, where it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And when I saw those words, it was like electric on the page, and it like jumped off the page and started my heart. That's what it felt like. And as I'm reading these words, I'm thinking, Jesus said that for me. Forget you guys, he said that for me 2,000 years ago. And I start, I honestly start reading this and every single verse I start reading, I begin to feel like I'm having a conversation with the Bible. I ask God a question, like God, how do I know you can hear my prayers? And then I read the footnote on the study Bible, it says if you wanna know, God can hear your prayers. Go to 1 John 5, sweet, boom. And so I'm reading the Bible, going back and forth. And I finally get to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 says, He who proclaims me before the people of this world, I will proclaim before my Father in heaven. And he who denies me before the people of this world, I will deny before my Father in heaven. See, I had all the evidence that I needed. I had all the spiritual guidance I had asked for. And now I had emotional comfort through the word, knowing it was the word of God, but I hadn't proclaimed. I looked at God and I said, God, if if I do this though, I have to give up my family. Matthew chapter 10's next verses, you wanna know what they are? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. As I read that, I said, God, it's not just my parents though. It's my whole life. What the next verses say? He who is not willing to pick up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Yeah, God knows the cost. The cost that Muslims have to pay today, the cost that you might have to pay if you're listening to this, is not a new cost. It's the cost the disciples had to pay from the very beginning. It's the cost we all must be ready to pay if we're gonna follow Jesus. And so I got on my knees and I prayed something. (laughs) No one had told me about the sinner's prayer. Prayed something that sounded very Muslim, but uh, I did say, Lord, I believe you are Jesus and I submit to you. And I thank you for having taken my sins, died on the cross, and risen from the dead. I wanna follow you with my life. And that moment, I had intellectually assented to the gospel. But I don't think I had really grasped the gospel quite yet. That wasn't until a few days later when I saw my father cry for the first time in my life. My father was a 24-year veteran of the U.S. Navy. To me, he was like my archetype of strength. He was like my Superman. And here's what he said to me, and this is all he said. Nabil, today I feel as if my backbone has been ripped out from inside me. And my mother didn't say a word. It was like there was a light that had been in her eyes up until that day, and I just turned it off. She hasn't been the same since. And after that conversation with them, I just fell on my knees and just started saying to God, God, why didn't you kill me? Why didn't you kill me, God? 
Because before they found out, I was a believer, I was saved, I would go to heaven if you killed me, I'd be happy, you'd be happy, they'd be happy, we'd all be happy if you just killed me before I had to tell them, why didn't you kill me? And in that moment, you know how you get when sometimes you're crying, you just start repeating stuff? I'm just like, why didn't you kill me? Why didn't you give me? I got all kinds of stuff coming out of my face. I got like saliva and tears and mucus, and I'm just, God, why didn't you kill me? And as I'm saying that, repeating that, why didn't you kill me? Why didn't you kill me? I heard these words, because this is not about you. In that moment, my life, my theology, my everything was just rebooted. And I stood up from there, and I walked outside. By the way, this is, I had been crying all night, so this is the next morning. I walk outside, and I know this sounds cliche, but it's true, everything looks different. Everything looked different. It was the same apartment, the same tree, the same street, but it all looked different. And the one thing that looked the most different was when I saw someone walking across the street. Now, I'd seen that millions of times before, but for the first time, I realized that's not just someone, that's someone that God was willing to die for. Can you, I mean, think about this. As a Muslim, my whole life, I believe that God sat on his throne and he would never enter into this world and he ruled us from above and he gave us a bunch of things to do and he would judge us at the end of time. But this story is that God was willing to enter into this world in a filthy world. And he was willing to, to live as a carpenter, blue collar laborer. And he's willing to live with people who would ultimately betray him. And then he's willing to go to a cross and suffer and die for the sake of sinners. Our God who created the universe, all the stars in the sky, he just thought them into existence. That God is willing to die. And as he tells us that he loves us so much, he's willing to die for us, this is what he says. As I have loved you, so love one another. And if I'm willing to watch someone walk across the street and let them go about their day, and I'm not willing to love them so much that I'm ready to die for them, then how am I following Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus if he's willing to die for people who sinned against him and I'm not? How am I a follower of Jesus? And in that moment, I realized what the gospel was. The gospel is not something that you just hear and believe. If it doesn't change your life, it hasn't hit you yet. And in that moment... I realize that this God is worth everything. This story is worth sharing with our lives. Oh, and our lives are in his hands. And if we die today, we're gonna be taken care of, but there are millions, in fact, billions of people for whom that is not the case. And if we lived every second of our lives for their sakes, only then would we truly honor this God who is willing to live the life we should have lived to die the death that we should have died. That's our God, and that's my story. So let's pray together. God, I know that there are people here in this room who are hearing some of this for the first time, that we don't believe off of blind faith. That's not what you've called us to do. You've called us to have a reason for the hope that lies within us. You've told us to be able to explain the truth gently. God, there are people here who are beginning to hear what the Christian message is all about. Not believing in my God versus your God or not believing in, in all these crazy things, but believing in a God who loves us so much, he is willing to pay the penalty for us. A God who loves us not based on performance, but because he's our father. And fathers love their sons no matter what they do. God, I pray that you would just enter into people's hearts right now. And I pray, Lord, as we finish out tonight, as we go into Q&A, God, that you would be leading hearts and minds right now, whether here in this room or across cyberspace. God, we need you. This life is too short to live on our own. We need you in this moment. So God, please be with us. Please prompt our hearts and please lead us for the rest of this night. We pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, folks, come on in, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Lee, Lee found his glasses, so he's back with us. That's good. Uh, we're going to have some fun. We're going to interact a little bit with Nabil now and ask a few questions that probably are on a lot of our minds. 
and then we'll, in a few minutes, shift to some Q&A time. So, um, Nabil, I want to start with a question that I know may be a bit sensitive, but I think it's on everybody's minds. And that is, can you, what can you share with us about since then? Like, you've been a Christian now, how long? I've been a Christian since 2005. So, about nine years. Um, you've had a lot of time since coming to Christ, since those events with sharing with your parents that you shared you know, earlier. What's happened since? Where are things at with your family now? Well, um, the first few years were extremely difficult. Um, right off the bat, my parents thought I had gone crazy. Uh, they said something's wrong with our son. So they started sending Muslim missionaries to me to try to convert me back. And uh, I would just start asking them questions. And uh, you can't talk back to your elders in our culture. So they said, our son must have become disrespectful. Uh, but he's not disrespectful. He's a good boy. So there must be something wrong with him. So they started sending me to psychiatrists. Um, really? But I was in medical school at the time studying psychiatry. So I started making <laughs> friendships with the psychiatrist. They didn't like that. Um, ultimately, when I was getting married, they said they didn't agree with that. So they didn't come to my wedding. Um, which was very difficult. Um, and then when I graduated from med school, I said I wanted to go into ministry. Um, and they just said, well, now you're just trying to hurt us. Since the only point of pride we had left was that you were going to be a doctor, now you're becoming a Christian missionary. Um, so at that point, they cut off all communication. Um, it was a very, very difficult time. But over time, God does his work. Um, and this past year, um, my wife is trying to, Michelle, she's trying to learn the language that my parents speak, to speak their heart language. That's been having an impact on them. Is that Farsi? It's Urdu. Urdu. And then my, um, my, uh, my mentor and uh, the organizer of uh, Ravi Zacharias International Mysteries, Ministries, Dr. Zacharias, he met my father. Um, and that was a huge moment. Uh, and then my dad's childhood dream was to go to Turkey, and so I said, let's go to Turkey together. So these things all started building uh, our relationship. I had the privilege last month of going to the U.S. Capitol. I was invited by the Senate chaplain to speak at a prayer breakfast. And for the first time in my life, uh, my father said, Nabil, I want to come hear you speak. Wow. Um, and so he came, and uh, at the end he sent me a text, and he said, I didn't agree with what you said but I'm proud of you. Mm. That's the first time I've heard those words. I didn't actually hear them, I read them. <laughs> it was a text, but I, I'll count it. <laughs> Screenshot of that one. Mm -hmm. So he, yeah, so not Christians yet by any means. My mother is still very hurt and still praying every day that I'll become a Muslim again, um, but there's restoration happening. It took nine years to see anything like that, but uh, something's happening, praise the Lord. You mentioned, you mentioned your father uh, was in the Navy. My father was, uh, when he joined the Navy, when he came here, he joined the Navy. So for 24 years, my father served the U.S. Navy, um, ultimately retired as a lieutenant commander. And what he told me in my childhood was, Nabil, you have to love and defend the nation that's taking care of you. Hmm. And so we as a Muslim family loved the United States. Um, and there are Muslim families, there are many Muslim families that love this country. So we can't take what some Muslims do and impute it to all Muslims. Right. I was just going to say, with, with your parents, you know, I pray for them, and I'm sure you would welcome anyone that would want to pray that God would continue to show him Thank you. his grace. What happened to uh, Betsy, that uh, poor girl whose yeah. face you devastated back in <laughs> she uh, a Muslim high today? Or? Is, yeah, well, <laughs> Betsy's pretty darn persistent. Um, <laughs> after, after that conversation, she invited me to a church play anyway, um, and then years later, I got an email from her saying, Nabil, how are you doing? Um, and I just told her, hey, I'm beginning to look into Islam and Christianity. I'm sure Islam is true, and I'm going to write up my case for you. I'll send it to you. And then a few years later, she emailed me again, and she said, Nabil, uh, how's that case coming? <laughs> and I sent her an email. I said, just pray for me. Uh, this was April. I became a believer in, in August. Um, so in April, I said, pray for me. I'm, I'm going to maybe have to do things that will really hurt my family. Um, and for the first time since high school, I met her at the same night when I spoke in D.C. because she lives in D.C. now. Huh. Um, and she is a solid believer as ever. And what she does is she just asks people if they know Jesus. Hmm. And she invites them to church. And so many of them end up Christians. I mean, how can you explain that, huh? <laughs> um, so she's still going for it, and the Lord is using her mightily. That's tremendous. 
You know, when I first met you, I remember we had a lunch in Virginia before a conference we were both speaking. First time I ever met Nabil, I met Michelle, I think the same day, and I met this character named David Wood, the guy who you've heard in the story, the, <laughs> the man who shared his faith with you. Um, t tell us a little about David. You guys have an interesting relationship. You guys go after each other. There's a little one-upmanship going on all the time. Tell us about it. Um, no, there's no one-upmanship going because he, he knows he'd lose because I'm... <laughs> Point made. <laughs> no, kidding, kidding. Um, I needed a David. Um, I needed someone who would love me and show me how silly I was being. I needed someone who would press me and say, Nabil, you're ignoring this, you're ignoring this. Uh, David is a hard, stubborn man, but on fire for the truth, and that's what I needed. Um, some people need love. Some people haven't been loved. In Islam, you have, just like in any other religion, you have some people who ha don't have fathers who stuck around. They don't have love in their lives. Um, and so you, you might need to approach someone with love. Uh, you might need to approach someone like David did with, with questions. And yet you said you knew he'd take a bullet for you. Yeah, you he was my friend at the end of the day. And even though we argued all the time, uh, I, I knew he cared about me. And so uh, whoever you are, I honestly believe God has crafted you that way for a reason. Acts chapter 17 tells us that he has crafted you and put you in a specific place and time so that people might reach out to him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. And so if you are someone who's hospitable, use your hospitality. If you are someone who's kind, use your kindness. If you're like a David who just challenges people, use that. And don't criticize anyone else because don't criticize another man's servant. And God will use wherever you are. Now David and I, after I became a believer, we went to ministry together. Uh, in 2006, the Da Vinci Code movie came out. Um, and our pastor said, well you guys have studied this stuff, come deliver a sermon on it. And so he and I gave a tag team sermon, which was really fun. And at the end, two atheists come forward to accept Christ. We didn't even do an invitation. They just walked forward. <laughs> and so we said... You allowed uh, it, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, we didn't say sit back down. Um, <laughs> so at that point, we decided to enter into ministry together. And he's still a ministry partner today. I, I'll tell you what. I met David that day and since I've gotten to know him as well. And I follow him on Twitter, uh, Act 17. Uh, and he, his ministry, x17.net, I believe. Um, I watch little video clips of him. I mean, he's training me on these things. He's, he's a genius. He is brilliant. Um, but wouldn't it be fun to hear his side of the story, a little bit of what David mm -hmm. says about Nabil? I think that would be cool. And so I got a video clip this week. <laughs> Really? Yes. They didn't tell me this. Of course this I This is did. your life. Wait, yes. I, I should have watched this first and censored no, it. No, no, no. Uh, I, I knew that that would not be allowed. Uh, David wouldn't allow that. So I have a video clip of David Wood, the man that led Nabil to Christ. Let's take a look at it. Hi, everyone. I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, why should we listen to Nabil when he went to medical school and isn't even using his degree? How smart can a guy who spends years earning a useless degree really be? But let me take you back to the beginning so you can see what I saw. Picture this. In 2001, at Old Dominion University in Virginia, there was a tall, handsome, extremely intelligent young man who would eventually become an unstoppable force in the world of apologetics. That young man had a friend named Nabil Qureshi. Nabil and I, of course, shared a hotel room on a school trip. I was lying in bed reading the book of Isaiah, but it was hard to focus because there was a Muslim eight feet away from me, eyeballing me while he's putting away his prayer rug. So I prayed. I said, Lord, some of my conversations with Muslims have not been pretty. So I'm not going to start a discussion with this guy. If you want me to have a discussion with him, let him start it. That's when Nabil said, so, are you a hardcore Christian? And I said, yes, I am. We talked a lot on that trip, and Nabil's absolute confidence in Islam was astounding. He told me that Islam is clearly proven by science and history and logic and reason, and that anyone who investigates it with an open mind will see that it's the truth. After listening to Nabil's defense of Islam, I had one question. I said, Nabil, if what you believe is false, would you want to know it? And Nabil said yes and no. He said yes because I want to know the truth about God and no because it would destroy my family. I latched on to the yes part because that was the best part of him. Now you're getting the details of how things played out for Nabil over the next several years and you can get more details from his book. But I wanted to draw attention to that yes and no response because it's the key to understanding what we do when we're witnessing. 
Human beings in general have a yes and a no. We are created in the image of God. We live in God's world. God upholds and sustains us. And knowing Him is eternal life. So the best part of us wants to say yes. But we're also fallen. We like sin. We like going our own way and serving our idols. And that part wants to say no. Apologetics is persuading people to go with the yes and to resist the no. Apologetics training is learning the best way to persuade different groups to go with the yes and to resist the no. Nabil is proof that there are Muslims out there who want to know the truth and who are willing to give up everything to follow Jesus. And what his story does is it shows you the process that many of these Muslims will have to go through on their path to Jesus. It's a painful process, but it's worth it. Ask Nabil if it's worth it. As Christians, you're blessed with the privilege not only of giving Muslims answers and defending the gospel, but also of being there for them, supporting them through their most difficult hours until they can rest in the arms of Jesus. God bless you. <laughs>
Chapter nine, verse 111 says, Allah has bought your life and your property for this, that you may slay in battle and be slain. So you got the peaceful as well as the violent. Now historically, you can look into the pages of early Islam and see what Muhammad taught was an originally peaceful message. Chapter two of the Quran came early. Surah Al-Kafirun came early, and then it culminated, the last chapter of the Quran, the last major chapter of the Quran, which was revealed, is Surah nine, this violent ver- ch- uh, chapter. And so Islam, according to Islamic tradition, culminated into this message of ultimately violence, go out and subjugate people. Many Muslims today don't know that. They honestly haven't learned that. All they've been taught in the mosques is that Islam is a religion of peace. All they've been taught is these peaceful verses. You know, Islam isn't like Protestant Christianity. Protestant Christianity teaches sola scriptura, go to the Bible, exegete it for yourself. Muslims don't do that. They learn the Quran through their imams at the mosque, through their leaders. And so they're only taught these peaceful passages and so they honestly believe it. So the point I wanna get across to you is if you cross paths with someone who says Islam is a religion of peace, they are not lying to you. They honestly believe probably that it is a religion of peace. But you should know that their opinion is contrary to the swaths of centuries of Islamic jurisprudence which does not teach the same thing. And in fact, the evidence that is there is that Islam can't really be called a religion of peace in virtually any sense. Wow. All right, Uh, Lee, uh, maybe you have a question from Twitter. And let me just say, for those of you in-house, if you have some questions for Nabil, if you can just come down this aisle over here. And we'll start with Twitter questions and we'll go back and forth. And so, go ahead. Uh, Let me just, a quick follow-up to that. Sure. Um, So where does that leave us? What should our response be in light of that explanation? So uh, first thing is, if you want to read more about understanding jihad, there is a book called Understanding Jihad (laughs) by David Cook. He's a professor at Rice University. Amazing book. Read that. Um, The second thing I would want to say is Jesus looked into the eyes of those who were willing to kill him, and he loved them anyway. I mean, think of the centurion who claims at the end of Mark, surely this is the son of God. Look, take a look at those who were next to him on the cross mocking him. He was even willing to forgive one of them that very day. Jesus was not hateful of people who were caught in the system of sin. Jesus loved, and he was willing to die for us while we were yet his enemies. And in the same way, if we're going to follow Jesus, we shouldn't be afraid. There is no fear. Fear doesn't make sense as a Christian response. Anxiety, Philippians chapter four says, do not be anxious about anything. So there is no room for fear, there's no room for anxiety, but there's room for power and love. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and that does not exclude Muslim neighbors. So know the truth and love all Muslims and be willing to even die if you really consider yourself a follower of Jesus. Thank you, Brother Beale, for that. It makes me think Here's, of, of yeah. what you've often talked about, John Stott, what he said about Jesus as he was being crucified. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the prayers of Jesus for lost people, when you read the, the original Greek in which the New Testament's written, the imperfect tense of the Greek suggests that people, Jesus kept repeating his prayers for, you know, Father, forgive them, Father, forgive them, over and over again. So Jesus' prayers for spiritually depraved people who were torturing to death the Son of God continued right up until his final gasps on the cross. And therefore, how can we not pray consistently and fervently and expectantly uh, for for people uh, who are spiritually confused? All right, here's a couple of questions from, or I'll do one at least, from Twitter. This is from a woman named Beth. She says, didn't Caliph Omar start the process of compiling the Quran only a few years after Muhammad's death? Yeah, the the compilation of the Quran is very different from the Bible. You know, the Bible is 66 books, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament. Um, The Quran is very different. Um, And really, it only began to be compiled, according to the Islamic sources now, I'm not sure how much we can trust the Islamic sources, but according to the Islamic sources, the Quran was compiled not by Muhammad's successor, uh, well, there was a version compiled by his successor, but the final version was compiled by the third successor, And what he did, if you want evidence, by the way, for this, go to the book of Hadith, uh, which is the book of traditions on Muhammad, that is the most trustworthy, according to Sunni Muslims. It's called Sahih al-Bukhari. Go to volume six, book 61, and read Hadith number 509 and 510. So 661, 509, 510, it shows you that Uthman, 
uh, was willing to collect all the early Quranic manuscripts, he said, make one version of the Quran and then burn all the evidence. So that was the way the Quran initially became compiled. There's a, there's a great history to that from that point on. And yet the Muslim claim is this is the original revelation given to Muhammad. It's never been changed. Do most Muslims know what you just said? Some do. Um, and some will say that Uthman accurately gathered that which Allah wanted him to gather. Everything that was burned was variant. But that requires faith. That's not an evidence-based position. And there were all kinds of contradictions between those different there versions. There were, and this was the step that really began to get me because as a Muslim, I did not know what I'm about to tell you, which is crazy. Um, Muhammad handpicked four teachers of the Quran, again, according to Sahih Bukhari. Read book 61 of Sahih Bukhari if you want to know how the Quran was compiled. Of these four <laughs> teachers that he handpicked, two of them, one's named Abdullah ibn Masud and the other one's named Ubay ibn Qab, these two teachers, two of the four greatest teachers of the Quran, disagreed with today's Quran. Abdullah ibn Masud said there should only be 111 chapters. Ubay ibn Qab says there should be 116 chapters. Today's Quran has 114 chapters. So this isn't just minor differences. These are whole chapters that they include, the canonical differences. And there's so much more to learn. Read the works of Keith Small. He's uh, a scholar at Oxford. Um, he's a curator of the Quranic manuscripts of the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Keith Small, if you want to learn more about this. I want to go to our first question here in the house. Come on up to the mic. Hi, Nabil. Um, how would you answer my Saudi exchange student who has read your book and said, ah, but he's Ahmadiyat instead of Shia or Sunni? So some people, thanks for the question. Many people will uh, say, they'll point to the sect and they'll say, Nabil's sect is not a sect that we agreed with. And, and, I'll, and you know, I, I, would, I could defend that. I could say, no, 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 that's a problematic position, but I'm not going to. I'll do the even if argument, and I'll say, even if you're right, and my sect is a different enough form of Islam that it doesn't apply, that doesn't change any of the arguments. The arguments are still the same. So the arguments for the Quran, the arguments against the Quran, the arguments for Muhammad or against Muhammad, my sect of Islam, no one's sect of Islam makes a difference on that. By the way, there are many sects on Islam. If you want to learn more about that, buy a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by Nabil Qureshi. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, I've read that one. Yeah, yeah that's good. <laughs> I've met the author. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, another Twitter question I think is good from uh, Randy. How does God's love in Christianity compare to that of Allah in Islam? So in the central message of Christianity is love. That is the reason why God created this world, so that he can be in relationship with us, so we can be in relationship with him. And most Western thinkers think that all the religions teach that, so but, it's the same. But that's a very unsubstantiated position. Right. Um, God in the Quran says very clearly, he does not love those who do, and there's a series of sins that you could do, which would disqualify you from God's love. Um, some Muslims will refer to the 99 names of Allah and say, look, one of them is Al-Wadud, one of them is the loving God. Uh, but that's devoid of semantic content when repeatedly in the Quran it says over and over again, God does not love this person, God does not love that person. Whereas the God of the Bible is absolutely loving. He loves all people. And love is the reason why Jesus came to this world. Love is the reason why Jesus died on the cross. Love is the reason why Matthew 28 says, go out and make disciples of all nations. Love is the driving ethic of Christianity. But that's not the case in Islam. And let me just add to that, a lot of people think everyone believes in a heavenly father. And yet in Islam, the whole concept of father so, is lacking. It's right? very different. Uh, the first, if you ask virtually any Muslim, what's the first surah of the Quran you memorized? The first chapter of the Quran you memorized is chapter 112. Very short. Kul huwallahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad. Wa lam yakulluhu kafwan ahad. Wait, I'm going to have Lee repeat that. Go ahead. You, you know. <laughs> he wasn't Sorry, even. I was I looking love at Twitter <laughs> questions. When I, when, I give my testimony at, yeah. when I give my testimony at churches that do sign language, I love watching what they do. When <laughs> people saying people are trying to take notes. They go, ah, forget it. <laughs> the point of this, it, is, it says, the point of this is the middle verse there. God is not a father. God is not a son. That is the point of this chapter. And virtually every Muslim I've ever met says that was the first chapter of the Quran they memorized. And Muhammad says, according to the traditions, that this chapter of the Quran is worth one-third of the Quran's theological content. Wow. God is not a father. God is not a son. And so to just call God 
uh, our Heavenly Father and just to assume every religion believes that, again, it's, it's, it's just not true. Uh, the Quran very specifically denies God's fatherhood. Okay, let's go to the next question down here. Hi, Nabil. Hello. Aapko yahan dekke, aapki baatein sunke, hume bohut khushi hui. Shukriya, bohut bohut. Um, my question is about um, the doctrine of uh, common grace that we have in Christianity, where we believe that every good and perfect thing comes from above, the Father of Lights. Does uh, Islam have an equivalent doctrine? And if so, if not, how do they um, reconcile goodness that they see in infidels? That's a great question. Um, so. There is a concept of grace in Islam. Uh, now, it's different from the one in Christianity, but let me give you an example of the doctrine of grace in Islam. In Islam, Muslims believe that their salvation is based on their good deeds versus their bad deeds. And if you do more bad deeds than good, you'll go to hell. If you do more good deeds than bad, you'll go to heaven. A very performance-based soteriology. But Allah is gracious in Islam in that he can overlook some of your bad deeds and he has the ability to multiply your good deeds if he wants. And so within this system of works-based soteriology, he can show grace. The Christian concept of grace is different. And there's many, by the way, different views within Christianity, but the one that I espouse is that God is absolutely merciful and absolutely just. So he demands that every single sin be paid for. If he didn't, he wouldn't be just. But he also demands mercy for everyone. Otherwise, he wouldn't be absolutely merciful. And so, in order to reconcile these two things in Christianity, God does m demand payment for every sin, but he signs for that sin himself. He takes that sin upon himself on the cross. And he offers mercy to everyone because anyone who accepts that death, that substitutionary atonement, they can be with him forever in eternity. That's how Christianity reconciles it. In Islam, it's much more arbitrary, it's much more capricious. If Allah wants to forgive, he can forgive. If he doesn't want to, he doesn't have to. The successor of Muhammad, according to Sunni Islam, his name is Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr said, even if I, now this is Muhammad's successor and best friend. He says, even if I have one foot in heaven, I would be, I would be afraid of the deception of Allah. In other words, Allah could still take him and throw him into hell, because Allah does whatever he wants, which is a high view of sovereignty, but it does not allow God to be absolute in his mercy and justice. So that's the difference. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Good, thank you. Very good. Nabil, my last question for you is, what would you want to say to people, especially people kind of either not sure about everything they've heard or maybe in the, hanging in the balance a little bit, what kind of encouragement would you give? For those of you who are here, I think that we can probably put you into um, a few groups. Um, for one, uh, a lot of you are Christians who are here and who are learning about Islam, and I would like to ask you to consider why. Why are you here? If you are here to satisfy some curiosity and then to go back to your, to your daily lives unchanged, unwilling to reach those who God was willing to die for, I'd like to ask yourself, have you grasped the gospel? Have you grasped what Jesus said when he said, as I have loved you, so love one another? If you're afraid of Muslims and you think, oh, I don't know how they're gonna to respond to me, uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. Most of these people are genuinely loving and caring people. And you're missing out on a great opportunity of, of engaging in a new culture and in, in investing in, someone li in someone's life in a way that will reverberate through eternity. And if you're here to learn how to, how to reach out to Muslims, just remember love, love and truth together neither devoid of the other, love and truth. Finally, if, if you're here and you don't know Jesus and some of this stuff just sounds weird to you, God is love, God's willing to die on the cross for your sins, why would God have to die? Let me just tell you, keep seeking God, seek truth. Don't be afraid of asking questions because if God is truth, then you will never have to worry about seeking the truth, you'll end up at God. And so be willing to pursue your questions. No matter who tells you, don't ask questions. No matter who says, don't question the Quran, don't question Muhammad, or if someone says, don't question your pastor, or don't question your parents, well, maybe don't question your parents. But seek the truth. And when you find the truth, you will find God. And God is the most beautiful, 
wonderful being in the entire universe. And once you arrive at that, you will arrive at that peace you've been looking for, that purpose and that hope you've been looking for. So keep searching, keep looking. God is waiting for you. Wow, that's great, man. If Christianity were true, and it meant you had to give up everything to follow God, would you want to know the truth? I was a mama's boy. I, uh, every time we went out somewhere, if I were scared, I would run up to my mom. Um, I would stay very close to her. If I were sick, I would put my head on her tummy. Um, I was very, very close to my mother. My earliest memories are of my mother every day sitting me next to her and having me put on my skull cap and showing me how to recite the Quran letter by letter. I finished the Quran when I was five years old and by that time I had memorized the last seven chapters so that I could recite them during the five daily prayers. To be raised Muslim in the United States was a point of pride because we believed uh, that we had the truth. In my freshman year of college, my best friend and I had many conversations about faith. and We argued all the time about Islam versus Christianity. But one specific day, he pulled me aside and he said, Nabil, if Christianity were true, and it meant you had to give up everything to follow God, would you want to know the truth? It took a long time before I was able to determine for myself even if I lose everything, it's worth it. And when my parents did find out, it was the most painful day of my life, probably the most painful day of their lives too. And I'll never forget the look in my mother's eye. Her whole life is Islam, just like my life was. And now my whole life is Christ. And there's just no, there's no, um, there's no connection anymore. But to have Christ in my life makes every loss worth it. My hope and my prayer for this book is that everyone who picks it up would draw closer to one another. Muslims by understanding the gospel, Christians by understanding the passion and the love that Muslims have, and ultimately through all of this so that we can arrive at the truth and at a glory that will be given to God.